You're listening to the Well Woman Podcast. I'm your host, Gemma Lee, women's menstrual cycle educator, natural fertility coach, and daytime mermaid. This is a place where we discuss all things periods, poo, ovulation, fertility, and sex. Join me weekly as we rediscover our menstrual cycles, unlock its superpowers, and guide you back into your cyclical nature. Jen, welcome to the Well Woman podcast. Thank you for having me. You are very, very welcome. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today because we're going to be talking about something that I've been referring to for a very long time. And I didn't mention this to you before we hit record, but the topic of skin, hair and nails is actually one of the clicking reasons of how I kind of got into serving in the health industry. So oh, really? Yeah, really, really. So I'm excited to talk about this topic and maybe I'll share that story later, but yeah. I want to hear about you. Tell us what day of your cycle are you on and how are you checking in today? So I am on day 13. Mm-hmm. So day 13, I am pretty, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty regular, I'd say. And usually day 13 in general starts the ovulation process, cervical mucus and all the fun stuff that I'm sure you talk about on your podcast all the time. <laughs> it's generally just lots of energy, okay. right? Yeah. Lots of energy, feeling good. Um, yeah. And I'm excited to be here. Mm, me too. And I love that you are on the East coast of Australia and you're coming to us as your kids are going to bed. So thank you yes. for definitely dedicating that of time course. to be with us. Of course. You have a background in dermatology and that is going to lead us into our conversation about skin, hair, and nails and how our beauty bits give us the insight to our health. But tell yeah. us, I'm sure you have a story about how did you get into dermatology? Because I've I've only met a few hand like a handful of dermatologists in my time. And okay. I just how did you get into dermatology? Like what was the transition? Did you go to medical school and then be like, oh, I just really love skin? Sure. So I, so my background, I worked in dermatology, but my background is in medical. I'm a paramedical esthetician. Okay. So in my twenties, went to college, fine, you know, did my classes, went through all of it. Wasn't super inspired. Definitely was not a school. I didn't love school unless I was inspired by it. And I was really interested in it. So Back in 20, gosh, it probably was 2004. I graduated, it was 2005, 2006. I graduated with my medical aesthetics um, certification. So a license in general. So basically back then went to school, there were a couple of options. And so when you think about estheticians or cosmetic beauty, there are simple programs. And then the one that I enrolled in was more paramedical. So we did a ton of case studies, lots of acne, lots of problematic skin. So we were hands-on as students, which was amazing. Had a great instructor. So from there, um, I, that program was about a little over, a little over two years, graduated and worked in the kind of like a spa atmosphere. And it was nice, but it wasn't for me. I wasn't challenged enough. So I started working with um, a husband and wife duo that were medical doctors. And I was their lead esthetician within their practice. And so worked with them. This was when I lived in Florida. And then back in 2010, we moved to Chicago. And I got more into dermatology while I was there. So Mm -hmm. my last job was in a very, very busy dermatology office in Chicago, in the city. And I was there for about seven years. And, you know, I, before I left, I was seeing probably on average 130 to 150 um, patients a month. So I was very busy. Um, lots of regular patients that would come and see me every month or quarterly. Everyone was a little bit different, but the majority of the people that I saw, I saw a lot of teens. I did see some men as well, but majority were women, um, you know, ranging in their usually like burnt out moms coming to do the best they can. So I'd have some clients that were in menopause that were struggling with acne that they're like, Jen, am I not past this point in my life? 
Um, and really lots of acne, lots of rosacea, just problematic hyperpigmentation, just different types of skin. But since I was working within dermatology, we saw a lot of nail conditions and a lot of hair, um, hair loss, alopecia, certain things that we would talk about with these patients. But my role was hands-on, all skin. And so when I was there, um, I had my second son in 2016 and my health kind of tanked a little bit, kind of hit rock bottom. I definitely am someone who feel, feel like I struggled with my health for most of my life in one way, shape or form, even as a kid. And 2016, things just kind of like the wheels fell off a little bit. Um, and I was determined to figure out what was going on. And I was being very dismissed by a lot of doctors and being told that it's in my head or it's hormones or it's part of being a mom and all these other things. So I said, forget this, I'm starting from scratch. And I kind of built things from the bottom up. And I spent two years really working on my health. And I started to see that in my practice with my patients. So we would be talking about their skin and I would ask them like, are you having bowel movements every day? What's your cycle like? Um, have you ever had your thyroid checked? And so making those connections and hearing so many things that everyone had in common, I decided back in 2018 to go back to school for nutritional therapy. Of course you did. <laughs> so went to school for nutritional therapy, absolutely loved it. 2020 hit and the pandemic happened and I have three children and one was a newborn at the time. And the boys were home from school. We had to do a lot of remote learning like everyone else. And it just wasn't feasible for me to go back to work. And so I decided to leave the dermatology office and put all of my, put everything into Genmeric Wellness. And so in 2020 was when I started working on Genmeric Wellness full time, went back to school again, and really have been in school consistently for the last three years focusing more on functional lab testing um, and really digging in more into the why behind so many of these symptoms that were being dismissed at, especially as women. Um, and just that's really been my focus is really supporting women in all stages of life, um, you know, and listening to them and not dismissing them and letting them have a voice because I know how familiar that is not to. So that's kind of a little cliff notes on the last 18 years, you know, the life a story of Jen. Um, thank you so much for sharing. I, I really love that you have such a great specific understanding around skin, hair and nails. I find, you know, working with the cycle and women's health and being in that area for a long time and studying the history of women's health in general and just women in general, you could say too, yeah. is that really for the last hundred years, women, it's changed in the last 20 years. So, you know, 80 years from 20 years ago yeah. <laughs> for, that, for that 80 year period, a lot of women were really put in a position where they had to, what's a great way to say this, put themselves up for demonstration that they were, you know, um, I don't like saying weak, but they were subtle enough and slim enough and vulnerable sure. enough to be protected and supported by a male in the heterosexual yes. world that was the early 19 you know in the early 1900s and i think because of that it really kind of put a lot of a lot out there in the beauty industry around yeah. you know how we need to look in our face and women going to bed with their rollers on but then getting up before their husbands went to work so they could you know put their makeup on and finish their hair so they always look the same when their husbands saw them and we live in such 100%. a different world today, right? And so yeah, I think we do. that our industry of beauty really kind of kicked back decades ago. And still today, there are some women who still live in that way. But I know in the last, let's just say 20 years, women are wearing more products on their bodies than ever before. And I oh, think yeah. the last stat I saw was that the average woman wears 513 chemicals and toxins on their skin and their body every day. Yeah. And, and it's like, everything, right? And then the I think the problem is too is something something doesn't look perfect, right? Your nails might not look perfect. So you'll cover them up with a lot of polish or acrylics or gels or whatever it is. And then your hair doesn't look great. So you're doing things to change the color or change certain treatments. 
Same with your skin. I mean, there are so many products for every single thing, millions of them, right? It's like you walk into a Sephora or anything and there's a product for everyone, depending on what it is. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some of those things might work, quick fixes, but you know, especially focusing on women's health and hormones, that it's a lot of it is a little bit of a toxic soup that we have going on. And so if we can focus more on that internal healing, we might not need to buy as many products and we can put our money elsewhere, right? Like it, it's a big industry. It's a huge industry. And I also think that women don't give themselves, and I'm stereotyping here because, you know, I think men also fall, all genders fall into this category, but sure. we don't give ourselves the opportunity to see ourselves at our most natural state to see, well, what does my hair really look like? And then what yeah. does my skin really look like? Or most women that I, um, you know, get a chance to talk to in maybe events or whatnot is I'm like, everyone look at your nails. And most people are like, well, my nails are painted. I can't see my nails. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. well, that's a missed opportunity for you checking your nail health because your nail health is a great sign of your bone health. Yeah, so Absolutely. Let's talk about how does our skin, hair, and nails actually give us insights into our health? Sure. So really, when you think about a time that you're sick, um, maybe you've had the stomach bug or you have the flu, and you can look in the mirror and you can just see that your skin feels a little lifeless, right? Your skin feels a little lifeless. You might have some breakouts. You might be a little extra dry because your body's going through something. And just like a lot of times when people had COVID sometimes afterwards, right, their hair was falling out, whatever the case may be, the outside of your body, just like when someone looks at, we usually measure metabolic health purely by looking at the size of someone. And so I try to change that conversation that it is so much more than what you weigh or what your pant size is, but also what your hair looks like. Is it more dry? Is it more oily? Is it falling out in clumps? Um, you know, does it have a shine to it? What does your skin look like? Do you feel like you're always getting breakouts or maybe you are so dry that you feel like any moisturizer isn't helping, or you have a lot of pigmentation, um, and other things, even like cracked heels, um, or dry lips all the time, you know, that can be very much a reflection of what's going on in the inside in general. And so, mm -hmm working really focus points. I always, we call them the foundations in nutritional therapy. And just in general is the foundations, the foundation of your home, your body has to have good support. And if the foundation is broken down, you're going to see it in your roof and your windows and the inside walls of your home. So thinking of that as your skin, your hair, your nails, as that reflection. I think that's a really great analogy because most people, when they notice that the wall is collapsing in on their house, they're like, oh, yeah, God. we have yeah. to do something about what, this. What, exactly. Yeah. Like and the cracks love, in the walls. Yeah. Yes. And I love that you mentioned about the hair thing because, you know, I've had two, I've got two hair stories for you. So I shaved my head for um, leukemia when I was, God, years ago. My hair was so long. I have long hair now, but it was longer than yeah. now. To watch your hair grow back after, you know, you've had it cut or colored and styled a different way. It was actually a really fascinating experience in my early 20s. Did it change? Like, it did didn't. It, was it, no, okay. Because I know was, some people will have curly hair. Like, it'll yeah, change. Oh, I wish. I wish I had curly hair. Like, when I was yeah. a kid, my mom used to tell me that if I ate my crusts, I would get curly hair. So I ate all yeah. the fucking crusts. <laughs> That's hilarious. Never, That's never so got curly funny. hair. But the funniest part of that story, Jen, is that I grew up thinking I was going to get curly hair when I grew up because all of my aunties, my mom's one of six kids. She's got four sisters. So five women in her family. And I thought I was going to get curly hair like them, but they all had yeah. bloody perms. And so oh, I always yeah. thought I was going to grow up getting curly hair and it never happened. Yeah, so that's so funny. I think I was like an early teenager when I learned that. And I was just like devastated that I was never going to get curly hair. So that's the first story. But the second story, and you mentioned this yourself, is that post-COVID hair loss. Like I was experiencing yeah. like postpartum hair loss and that was the yes, first time ever. Yes. And I was like, I need to like, yes, my body's been under extreme stress, 
and I was very sick during COVID or when I had, when I had COVID and um, I knew I had to repair and restore my body, but I was also like, I feel like I'm doing everything I possibly can. I need help. So, you know, I went and saw a nutritional therapist, um, nutritionist at, um, at that stage and to get some extra support. And it was a sign. I was like, hang on this is like a big fat knock on my front door by the inspector being like, there's something going on inside. Like, let's check that out. So what are the signs to look out for that you recommend for, let's talk about hair first. And then let's talk yeah. about nails because I think skin is like a whole nother topic. That yeah, we sure. So let's talk about so, skin, um, hair and nails first. So one thing with hair, and we'll see this a lot when clients come to me, they are talking about hair loss. I hear that more than anything is my hair loss has increased or my hair is really dry. And so one big conversation to have is, and that we have to remember is our thyroid is extremely important, um, especially when we're talking about hormones and we're talking about stress and all of these things, they all go hand in hand, right? And so your thyroid plays a role in your metabolism. And so that's going to help with the growth and development of your body in so many different aspects. So a lot of times when I have clients coming to me, we are, they're talking about their hair. And so instead of just saying, here is a special shampoo and conditioner, we're going much deeper than that. We are talking and digging through their symptoms. I want to hear what their bowel movements are like. I want to hear what their libido is like, what their GI system is like. Are they dealing with bloat? What's their period like? Do they have cramps? So all of these different things. So when we talk about our thyroid, when our thyroid is overactive, we have one, but um, the majority we hear and see is a lot of hypo thyroid. So sluggish thyroid. (laughs) Yes. But some people do. I have worked with people who have more, you know, faster thyroids. Um, But a lot of times what we are looking at is going to be more hypothyroidism. So you go to the doctor and you say, doctor, I'm not feeling well, right? And they're like, okay, let me run a thyroid test on you. So they run your blood and they usually just look at TSH. And that is not enough to give us information on your thyroid. So taking that one step further, looking at labs, looking at your TSH, your T4, your T3, your reverse T3, all of your antibodies to really have a good picture of, okay, is it actually normal? Because I guarantee that the majority of your listeners have went to a doctor before and said, can you check on my thyroid? And the doctor comes back and says, it's normal. And then they feel lost. So one, we're not testing properly. Mm -hmm. Two, we have huge ranges and we need to have smaller ranges. Oh, I'm glad you're bringing this, this up too. So when we're looking at, you know, let's say TSH and ranges are going to vary depending on who you're talking to. And the point of nutritional therapy is not to treat and not to diagnose, right? We're not looking for disease. What we're looking for is prevention. So if your thyroid is almost out of the standards of too high, why would I wait until it's too high to flag it or do something? Instead, we're going to start working on being proactive and really working on thriving instead of just purely surviving. So we look at blood, we look at symptoms because your symptoms and your goals matter. And I think that we need to remember that that's your body talking. Um, And then a lot of times we also run something called an HTMA, which is a hair tissue mineral analysis. Mm -hmm. So when we think about root causes of things, we can just think about something purely as simple as stress, which we can look at a stress bucket. And when your stress bucket is really full and it's overflowing, you're going to notice more of these symptoms a little bit more. So when we look at your hair, maybe it's dry. um, You feel like it's lifeless. And there's no shine to it. Um, It's falling out. When we look at your nails, some things that we want to look at, are they breaking constantly? Are they brittle? Do they have ridges in them? Do they have white spots in them? Um, There's something on nails called spooning where you can see kind of like a spoon going in. Um, Mm -hmm. Other things when we think about your hair is what's your scalp look like? Is it itchy? Do you have dandruff? Do you have nail fungus? So those are all going to be things that we are talking about and looking at. And 
when you start to heal your body from the inside out, when you're feeding it properly, when you're hydrating it properly, when you're working on minerals, when you're pooping two to three times a day. So if anyone's listening and you're not having daily bowel movements, that's step Poop one. as often as you eat. <laughs> Poop, right? You need to be pooping every single day. If we're not doing those things, those are going to be the foundations. We have to really work on optimizing those things. And oftentimes, sometimes quick, we can see a difference in our, in our hair and our nails. And then other people, it takes time depending on what we have, what is the cause of what's going on. Mm. I love that because so many people just think that, oh, it's my hair. So I will try all the shampoo. Like a common thing I've definitely heard in my last 20 years of adulthood is, oh, my hair just won't grow. And it's a comment I often get um, from women is, God, your hair grows so fast. And um, it does, my, my hair does grow fast. So does the hair on my legs. So does sure. know, eyelashes yep. and all of that stuff too. And I think that the state of your hair growth and being able to grow up your hair after you've had your hair cut like that's a really good sign of how well your body's producing. And something I always love to say, Jen, is that if you're having challenges with your beauty bits and your, your body can't send nutrients to the most farthest extremity, which is your hair, which is probably going to be cut anyway, yep. then is your body internally, like the 22 organs that you have and the 600 plus bones, that you, um, sorry, muscles that you have, is that going to be getting all the nutrients that it needs as well? And so for our leaves and our flowers to blossom well, we need to have a really solid foundation in our trunk. 100%. Yep. And yep. Um, I love that you mentioned that about hair because a lot of people have a lot of trouble or challenge with hair growth and their hair yes. growing back. And I love that you mentioned thyroid with the hair. I'd love to ask a little side question. Yeah. Hair loss and thyroid health. Does that still apply for men? Because naturally we understand that men have more hair loss than women. Sure. sure. And obviously their endocrine systems are structured differently, but you know, if a man's in his thirties and he's lose and he's experiencing hair loss, is that a thyroid thing or is that potentially genetics? It, you know, I think the big side thing question is, for men who no, are, yeah. and all the women who are helping their men out. Genetics, genetics can play a piece in certain things, but we have to remember that, you know, we used to, I've learned like genetics is the gun and, you know, your lifestyle and epigenetics is going to pull the trigger. Ooh, so like while we have certain genetics that could be against us a little bit, I think that we still can change things and we can slow things down and we can work towards changing that instead of just falling into the, my dad has it, my grandfather has it. So who cares? Yeah. Cool. When it comes to men, we see, we do, we can, uh, men do struggle with thyroid issues in general, but also lots of like blood sugar concerns. Um, and just like you said, with focusing on the organs and digestion and other things. Um, also, a lot of times we'll see premature gray hair in women or in men. And that can yeah, actually... Man. That could be a, quite a few things, but one big thing is sometimes it can be the lack of um, copper in our body. So cerul, mm -hmm. so bioavailable copper, um, so ceruloplasm. So sometimes that can be um, a little bit of that, you know. And the other thing is when we're talking about it, we talk about thyroid, but your thyroid's very delicate and it can be impacted by so many different things. Mm. So if you're seeing these things on your hands and your nails and you're seeing fungus, we have to think, okay, what is this more? So is it going back to B vitamin deficiencies? Is it something like we're not absorbing our fat soluble vitamins? Um, are we lacking zinc? So a lot of times when we see those white spots on our nails, it tells us that we're not getting in enough zinc. Um, are we lacking in copper? Are we lacking in, you know, essential fatty acids? Are we able to break down the butter and the ghee and the good fats that we're eating properly? Do we have that liver and gallbladder support to break those things down so that we're not seeing the dryness on the outside? Mm. So there's a lot of different things from parasites to mold to candida, you know, yeast overgrowth, and also malabsorption of nutritional deficiencies that can add to it. And all of us have that one thing in common, right? Stress. So stress impacts everything. 
And it's not just sitting in traffic or going through a divorce or moving to a different state. It can be so many different things. It can be the beauty products that you're talking about, putting stress on our body. It can be heavy metals, you know, drinking non-filtered water, maybe using fluoride in our toothpaste. And so this is that stress bucket that when it becomes, it's kind of when you have that conversation of someone saying, I've always eaten this, but now when I eat it, it makes me feel sick. Or I used to always do this, but now maybe it's just age. It's like, no, your stress bucket is overflowing and it can't take any more going into it. Yeah, really great overview. Thank you for like deviating a little bit on onto males' health yeah. because I think that um a lot it's very easy for men to kind of fall into that category. Oh well, it's just part of being a male, right? And thanks sure. for the tip on gray hair. I've been going gray since I was twenty five, and I've got a few little like devil grays on the a few yeah on the devil yeah. grays. Um, but, but because I have some natural tinge of blonde in my hair, um, very minimal, but it definitely kind of makes it um. Trend, like trends is it hiding it's what's it when the armies wear camouflage sorry it's the word yes. I'm for. Yes. Yeah. camouflage is in there I'm not concerned about it but, but um great great tip on the on the copper though thank you for that personally. yeah and I think it's just the stress you know sometimes when we have I know in 2020 I had no gray hair <laughs> and then I feel like things went crazy and there was a little bit of a dumpster fire going on in the world and it was like where did these grays come from all of a sudden you know uh -huh. And so obviously things are going to, genetics are going to factor in and other things are going to factor in. But um, sometimes someone will come to me and say, I, I, overnight I had this happen. And is there any way to slow it down or reverse it? And sometimes there isn't. Sometimes, you know, it just depends on the client in general. Mm, and that takes body awareness to be able to be aware of those shifts and changes as they're actually occurring. 100%. So let's talk about skin now because this yeah. is such a, fascinating topic for women something that's a bit of a trend in Australia at the moment anyway or maybe where I live in Australia is Botox and girls yes. I say girls because you know we're talking about like 16 to 18 year olds you know seeking Botox and yeah. Botox is toxic that's where it gets its name from I just want to highlight that to everybody yeah but let's talk about skin because there is acne like you mentioned like premenopausal menopausal sure. acne being a, an adult woman in your early thirties and being like, I thought I was past this 16 year old. Yeah. Acne and Why am I getting yeah. it now? And then there's also the huge outbreaks that I feel like all different people are experiencing from rosacea to eczema to psoriasis. Um, there's lots happening out there. So talk to yeah. us about skin and the signs of skin and what do all these things mean for us? What's sure. your body trying to tell us? Sure. So, you know, we see everything from dry skin, especially as we get older, our skin might be a little bit more dry. And again, or in the winter time, we might notice more dry skin. Um, acne was huge when I was in practice. I mean, everyone came to me who had acne, it seemed, you know, teens and up. And it didn't necessarily care how old you were. That's the thing. And acne is frustrating because when you have acne it or anything in the beauty industry, you become so self-conscious of certain things. And I think one thing to, you know, no one's skin is perfect. What does perfect mean? And we have these filters now and we have all this makeup and we have so many things that I feel like so many people are hiding behind that um, and not really seeing a reflection of what true beauty is, right? Like we're covering it up so much and not really seeing that. And most everyone has a freckle or an acne scar or, or something going on in their life. Um, when it comes to acne, there's definitely different stages that we see. We have some that are just little clogged pores like blackheads or whiteheads, which we call like comedones. Um, then we have more whiteheads, pustules, papules, cysts, nodules that are going to be definitely more damaging below that surface. When we see acne, there are things that you can look up like face mapping to say where, what organ in the body does it reflect? And there in lies, there is never just one thing, unfortunately. So if you're someone who breaks out on your chin or maybe on your jawline, you, someone might say to you, it's hormonal, which is, can be very true. 
Um, but we have to remember hormone imbalances are going to be more of a symptom, not a root cause to something else going on. So when we see a lot of acne diving into, yes, hormones is one thing, but why are the hormones imbalanced to begin with? So we have to look into gut health. Do we have parasites? Do we have candida? Um, do we have malabsorption? So you might be eating the cleanest diet, but many Americans, especially 90% of Americans don't have enough stomach acid. So you can be eating the cleanest things, but it really is that saying, you know, you are what you eat. It really is more, you are what you absorb. Totally. So is that. your, you know, are you able to absorb all of the clean eating that you're actually doing so that your body can utilize it properly? So we definitely see a lot of mineral imbalances when it comes to skin. We see a lot of guts ranging from, you know, just not enough stomach acid. Maybe the liver is overburdened. Um, maybe we are struggling with some imbalance of bacteria. So more opportunistic bacteria, not enough. We call that like the weeds in the garden. You know, you don't want too many weeds that kill your flowers. The flowers are the normal bacteria. We start to see that imbalance. And so what we do is we look at that <clears throat> and symptoms. And then obviously what is going on with your acne. So usually I'll have clients track it when they're noticing it, when they're noticing the flare ups, is it really right before their period or during their period or during ovulation? Or is it just all the time? Mm. Um, so when we start to see things like on the body, like that can be very deep infections. Sometimes if we have chest acne or back acne, um, lots of men will complain about that too. And women, you know, I think that it's one thing people feel very embarrassed by it, but uh, so many people struggle with it. They just don't talk about it as much. And mm. a lot of times it's more than what you're putting on your skin. We have to remember that it's internal and it's showing on the outside. Mm. So that's acne. Other things that we see a lot, um, rosacea is another big one. I see that a lot with clients who have H. pylori um, or clients who have bacterial overgrowth going on in the gut. Um, when it comes to pigmentation and darker pigmentation on the skin, sometimes that can be another reflection of that liver, gallbladder, even consuming more um oils that are more, you know, your canola oils, your vegetable oils that go more rancid in the skin. Um, and that's showing up on your skin as that aging. Um, so those are some big ones that we see a lot. Other things that I see a lot is that eczema or psoriasis or really dry, dry skin, you know, cracked heels um, that we start to see. And a lot of times that is another one where we need to look at your liver. We need to look at the gallbladder. We need to make sure that you are able to absorb and have a good fat metabolism going on within the body. So liver, I would say, is one of the biggest pieces when it comes to your skin. Liver, lymphatic drainage, making sure that your body is detoxing every day. And that's something that I think when we hear liver cleansing, right, we think like it's January 1st, I need to do a liver cleanse. And I always talk about how you need to be supporting your liver every single day and detoxing every single day. So pooping every single day, sweating every single day, you know, getting out in nature, getting out, getting some sunshine um, and moving your body in ways that feel good. Mm, so important. And I think that comes back to that whole consistency is it's the little things you do every day that count, not the things that you do sometimes. Sure. And, you know, I just recently finished a two week Panchakarma cleanse in India, uh -huh. which is an Ayurvedic 14 day cleanse. And in a very luscious environment, how to say it. Like we think of like oh, Thailand, I'm sure. palm trees on the beach and oh, amazing. Um, yeah. you know, chefs that make food just for you. And I think the thing that um I wanted to bring up about that is that it's not just about doing the panchakarma, it's about what you do after the panchakarma and what you do consistently every day following 100%. that. So what are the habits yeah. that you've learned there that you can bring home with you? And hundred percent I feel that we do live in a very like a very fascinating age and era at the moment it's like oh I'll just take this pill and this will fix that but it's the doing it every day like if you're going to use a pharmaceutical graded multivitamin to help improve you know your um you know 
acceptance of different nutrients and what you're applying and amplifying the food that you're also eating is that using it for two weeks is not going to give you the great difference. Yeah. You know, it's the things yeah. you do every day. And personally, I've been using a product like that for 11 years and it has definitely filled up my cups in times where I have been pressured in times where I've not been able to eat my five cups of spinach to get a quarter of my daily amount of vitamin E. Like sure. it, yeah. it helps a support, but the thing is people are like, I can't commit to that or I can't commit to tracking my cycle every day, or I can't commit to, you know, using a liver product that supports me or eating this particular food every day or doing it every second day. And so I think the biggest talk or the biggest point here about skin, hair and nails, particularly is it's what you do every day that really plays the biggest role in your health. Yes. And obviously there's a time and a place to do a protocol and to do a certain something that you have to possibly stick to. So let's say, you know, you do have um, parasites, let's say, and it's, it's, you're seeing it and we're picking it up in labs. And there's a reflection here where, yes, we might be doing targeted supplementation at certain points that are going to target certain things, but the foundations still matter. And that's the big piece is you still want to be working on that gut and all of the things and your thyroid and your minerals and your blood sugar. I mean, blood sugar is huge when it comes to hormone imbalances and working in derm, you know, unfortunately I was, our doctors were fantastic and they were amazing for so many different things, but it was very hard because while I was in school and after, while I was working I was seeing two different things, right? So I was seeing someone coming in who maybe had acne and they were being told to go talk to their doctor and go on birth control to fix their acne, but that's not going to fix your acne, right? It's just going to shut down your hormones and your acne is going to reflect looking better. And I understand that sometimes we need that fix. Sometimes we need that expensive product maybe, or the other things, But when we get off the pill, your acne can come back and so can all of the other things. So it's more encouraging people to do the work. And sometimes it feels like a lot of work, but gosh, you can do a lot with just the basics. Totally. You You know, like you really can, like they matter. And even when we have the fancy supplements and the fancy stuff, I always remember, like, go back to the foundations, go back to the basics. Because if you skip it, it's going to come knocking down your door sometime, you know, and it's so important to not skip that stuff. Sometimes we like to call that, like, I don't remember who said it, one of my friends, but it's like the, the not, the not sexy stuff, right? Like the sex, like you want the supplements and the things and the products and the red light and all these fun things, but it's like, oh, wait, I should be eating a proper breakfast. I should be eating more food that doesn't come with a label, right? Like that is a basic Thing, so that that mean I need to cook more at home? Oh, I don't want to right? I know it's yeah. hard. All know, of that. Um, yeah. I want to ask you about those basics, but I do want to jump in and talk about period acne before we go there, knowing sure. that so many people are going to be here listening and tuning in being like, I've had period acne before in my, in my life. And yeah. how does our menstrual cycle or our reproductive system, so our endocrine system, affect our skin health and our nail health and our hair, our hair health around menstruation or ovulation? Like what tips or insights can you give us on the cycle of the women? And yeah. yeah. So everyone's going to be a little different. Some clients will see breakout during their ovulation. Mm-hmm. Um, some will be just, you know, three days before their period, their bleed. They're like every single time, same pimple, same spot on my chin doesn't go away. So the big thing to encourage is that is your body. There's a sign there. Your body is just talking. And I think that having a pimple once in a while, like, I think we have to normalize normal skin, right? Like oftentimes we get a pimple, we stress about the pimple and then the cortisol makes the pimple come back. And then we stress (laughs) it's that ongoing cycle. And it's the vicious cycle. So for anyone really focusing on hormones and trying to help with that, I would say the biggest thing is going to be supporting your liver 
a, as much as possible, especially in all of the phase, but especially that luteal phase, um, really supporting your liver with certain foods and making sure that you're having those bowel movements every day. So if you're not having a bowel movement every day, that would be your first step in trying to work on your acne and that hormone balance, that cycle that you're seeing. So, you know, there's not one particular supplement that's going to help, but the big thing is making sure you're eating, making sure you are actually fueling your body as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I think some of us get in this headspace of I'm eating 1200 calories and that's it. And it's like, that you're not, you're eating, that's like, you're a toddler, right? Like you need to be eating more as a female and remembering that your thyroid, that's your energy, your metabolism. We need that fuel, which is really important. So eating enough is huge. Um, and then usually I will tell clients some things to have in the toolbox is castor oil packs. I really love, um, the one that I really like is from queen of thrones. It's a very easy castor oil pack that, and is this for abdominal use for the menstrual cycle, or do you use castor oil packs at different parts of the body? Cause I know, in, you know, Ayurvedic, um, sure. Treatments, they use castor oil, you know, anywhere, everywhere. Yeah. You can do everywhere, but I, for this purpose, I would say liver over the liver. Um, so working on that, incorporating certain things like dandelion root tea, um, other teas that I really, really love nettles is really great. Hibiscus, peppermint, ginger, um, red raspberry leaf tea is really great as well. Um, certain things like bitter greens. So arugula, anything that's a little bit bitter, um, beets are also really, really fantastic for your liver support. And then there's certain things like milk thistle, right. And other things that are really, really great. But the big thing is we want to make sure that we're supporting our liver all the time. And it's very hard to give a clear cut one thing that works without having hearing someone's story. Mm. But I think, I think every single person can continue to work on their liver support as much as possible. So sometimes if we start to notice that it is really having that check-in and really talking about what your period looks like every month. So what does your report card report card look like? Are you having heavy breast pain? Are you having clotting? Are you, um, is your period really short? Maybe it's only lasting two to three days or is it really long and heavy and painful? So usually when we're having those conversations, we can work on making that more balanced, those symptoms. And then in turn comes the less acne and seeing a change in that overall. Does that make sense? It does. And the more you can, I am a big believer that the more you can make a steady transition into change, the more that change is going to be lifelong as opposed to a quick fix change that lasts for two weeks. Sure. And I think that's where people would be like, but does it have to like, can I just fix it right now? Like, can I just get it over yeah. and done with? But if you can make changes that really create impacting change on your lifestyle, that yeah. habit and that new change or that new transition with your skin health or your hair health or your nail health or your gut health or your poo or whatever it is, cycle health, that's going to take you for years to come. Oh, Until for sure. It continues to evolve or is in a new circumstance, yes. new life change, new work, new living area, um, yeah. community, whatever it might be. And then going, oh, okay, now I'm ready yep. for another change. And so I think we buy into the fact that, oh, well, I'm 52 now. My body's just, it's, it should be the same as when it was 32 and the food yeah. I was eating is just no longer serving me anymore. And it's like, well, as you age, your body is transitioning. Sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, and that's the thing I think about my twenties or even, even my early thirties, where it's like the more eating out, not drinking enough water, just all of these different things that you hear people talk about and you're like, whatever. You know, and it's like, yeah. something's going to get me someday. And you're like, yeah, but these things actually do matter. Staying hydrated and staying hydrated on a cellular level, not just drinking a gallon of water and flushing out all of your minerals, actually absorbing those things. And one thing that people can do is they can just put a tiny pinch of even a very like, I like like a white sea salt 
Um, so a, a nice sea salt that they can just add tiny pinches or minerals to their water to make sure that they're actually absorbing the water that they're drinking constantly and not flushing out their minerals is important. Mm. So and many great that on your skin. Yeah. So many great tips. This has been awesome, Jen. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I'm sure people are going to be like, oh my God, I need to suss out this woman and learn more about all my hair, nails and skin. <laughs> So where can people find you and connect with you, Jen? Sure. So I would say the best place to find me and where I'm most active and definitely have more posts and things on all of the topics that we really talked about more in depth um, is on Jen Merrick Wellness on Instagram. Okay. I will pop that link in our show notes so people can connect with you. And there's links from your link in your bio there on Instagram, I know. So people can learn more about you and maybe contact you or how to get in touch there. Absolutely. Um, this has been really beautiful. And I'd love to ask you a final podcast question if you're open sure. to it. Yeah. Uh, switching gears a little bit. This is more like a specific podcast question. And I ask okay. all of our guests this. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. But I want you to think back, Jen, to your first menstruation. Okay. And what are three things you wish you had have known at that time in your life when you started menstruating that you now know today? I only have to pick three. Okay. Um, (laughs) Well, you can have as many as you like, to be honest. Yeah. I think having more of a, it was more of a fear than it was celebrating how amazing having your period is and what this fifth vital sign is. I think that was more thing. There was a very lack of education for a very long time. So I wish I had more education around it. I wish I had less fear and disgust. I feel like that was a big feeling. You know, if you hadn't needed a tampon, it was like, oh my gosh, you have to hush about asking for a tampon. People still do that though, you know? Um, And I think the education piece is really kind of more into two and three because understanding your actual cycle and really paying attention and noticing that in different parts of your cycle, you can work out differently and you can have different feelings and really honing in on that, I think is really important. And something that's so amazing to now know that so many people didn't talk about in general. Beautiful. Thank you for you sharing know? all things yeah. I know that so many of our listeners can resonate with. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's no time like the present to like start adapting that and living in those ways. So 100%. thank you. Thank you. you. And thank you for being here and sharing all of your beautiful information and education about our core beauty signs of the body and how they can be clues to so much more about what's going on inside. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into every episode of the Well Woman Podcast. For everything we mentioned in today's episode, you can find this in the show notes over at wellsome.com forward slash podcast. If this episode excited you, please hit follow on Spotify, which means all of my episodes will pop up in your feed weekly so you never miss a weekly drop. I'd love you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts too. Love this episode? Come and follow me over on Instagram at wellsome underscore Gemily. Say hi and share what you've taken away from this episode with me. Now, is there a bestie, sister, or a friend who you know who might be fed up, frustrated, and confused with their cycles? Are they ready to join you in awakening their cyclical essence too? Well, take a screenshot of this podcast episode, share it on your socials, email it, text it, or any way you need to get it to them. So together, we can all live in flow, harmony, and balance with our cycles. Now, until next time, beautiful, get connected, listen to your body, and remember, body confidence all begins with living in tune with your menstrual cycle.